Hey, welcome. My name is Rachel Smith, and this is the Natural Health Rising podcast. I am a certified functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner and the owner of Natural Health Rising, which is my online holistic functional medicine company where I help people who have autoimmune diseases, chronic illnesses, mystery symptoms, and a whole host of other imbalances restore their health by natural means. On this podcast, you're going to hear conversations between myself and other health experts on functional medicine and general holistic health. My goal is to provide you with the tools you need in order to help you rise to your healthiest and happiest self. On today's episode, I have with me Narado Zico Powell, who is a certified Lumen metabolic coach and holds seven fitness and nutrition certifications from the International Sports Sciences Association. He's also the host of the Matter Over Mind Experience, which I actually had the pleasure of being on a couple months ago. That was really fun. And now it's my pleasure to have Gerardo on my show today. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Call me Zico. Call me Zico. I think. Uh, Zico? I think of, yeah, call me yeah. Zico. It's more, you know, I kind of prefer that way, but go ahead. Perfect. Okay. Well, why don't you start by telling everyone a little bit more about yourself and how you got into what you do today? I know you have, you have like some health struggles and stuff you went through on your journey. So you can t- talk about that too. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole story. So I'm going to try to keep this like the reader's digest version, right? Yeah. So I grew up in Montego Bay, Jamaica, and I was underweight. I would, my struggle is a little different than most people. Most people are overweight, trying to lose weight. I was underweight. But I was also, but it's also common in Jamaica to be underweight, but I was underweight for a Jamaican. So that was even worse. And asthma was one of the things that I struggled with among other health issues, but asthma was my main thing. And Jamaicans, we have a saying, and I think it's actually they say in other places in the Caribbean too. It's like, if uh, you're going to grow out of it, you know, they're like, you're going to grow out of your asthma. You're going to grow out of this. And I'm like, that, I don't know what, that doesn't even make any sense. So apparently that's the thing. I never grew out of my asthma. It kept getting worse. So later on in life, I realized that even when I moved to America, pollen was my big thing that even made my asthma worse. And as the pollen count got worse, there are times I'll come home like dizzy, can't, you know, can't just can't really move, can't really do anything. Just lay on the couch, couple call off work, stuff like that. And the last time I went to the doctor, the well before I started making my health changes. They added a couple more prescriptions to me with like a um, Advair and some pills. I don't remember the name of it. And that was a trigger for me because I don't like pills. And I asked the doctor, I said, is something I can do outside of this, right? To really get myself off this medication and have my asthma. And the doctor's like, he kind of smiled and was like, no, not, not really. I mean, you can try improving your nutrition, but he had no idea what to tell me because most people probably don't even ask that question anyway, right? And of course, we know that most doctors don't take nutrition courses. So I said, no, forget this. I started studying. And the first book I picked up was The Pan Paradox by Dr. Stephen Guntry. He's my favorite doctor up to this day. Started reading it. I'm like, this man is talking about lectins. What is he talking about? Fruits and vegetables are good for me. This is nonsense. But I kept reading. I was like, you know what? Let's make a couple. Because what sparked me was he talked about sprouting, like soaking and pressure cooking beans and rice and and I was like, you know what? But my parents did that. My grandparents did that. So that kind of triggered me. I was like, hmm, he might have a point. So I started making like little changes as I went along. And as I made changes he recommended, I started feeling better and better and better. And I'm like, hmm, he might have a point here. So as I'm going through this journey, I say, you know what? There's so many things that I need to learn and other people need to learn. So let me start helping other people in the meantime. So I started working on my fitness nutrition certification and my personal training nutrition. I started there, started training at a gym. And as I was training, the questions people came to me with, I started realizing that outside of this is how much you burn, this is how much you need to eat, people have no idea even in the fitness world really about nutrition. So I started digging deeper and deeper and started studying more and more and more. Now, long story short, years later, um. You know, I have seven certifications, not just in nutrition, but also in like corrective exercise, exercise therapy, you know, stuff to teach people functional way to improve their health if they have, you know, joint pains or any kind of deficiency along with, along with being metabolically flexible. So that's why I started partnering with Lumen and got their certification. And 
along with that is I've been off my medications for, I'll say three and a half years. I haven't been on any medication at all. An interesting story, the gym where I train, the AC was out and the la this happened once two years ago. And when I was there the last time, my, I couldn't breathe. Like I worked out, but I was having a hard time breathing, but I was able to finish the workout. This time the AC was out, no breathing problems whatsoever. And I was telling somebody that story, like how even as I'm getting older, things, uh, things are changing in my life and I'm improving how I age. I'm improving my sleep quality. I'm improving my, um, uh, my, how I perform and all those things that should get worse as I chronologically get older are actually getting better as I chronologically get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing's been happening to me over the past six years. <laughs> um, was there a specific food that you identified or foods that were triggering the asthma? Or was it something different? It was a combination of things. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was going organic. Because hmm. uh, when I, so growing up in Jamaica, everything was, things have changed a little bit now, but back then everything was naturally organic. Uh, but go, moving here, it's a lot different. You know, food is cheaper here, of course. And there are reasons why it's because the way we form, farm and the, I should say the shortcuts that we may take. And, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but so, but going organic, has made a huge difference. When I started eating foods that were cleaner, I started feeling better because it got to a point. And when I started listening to Dr. Stephen Gundry and all the podcasters, I started listening to them and started reading a bunch of books and learning stuff and got my certifications. But as my body became healthier and I got my certifications, I started realizing that I, would, I was sensitive to certain things. So I would go to, not to call anybody out, but part of the answer, I'll go to Chipotle. And I would eat like, you know, be, you know, beans and rice and stuff like that. And I realized that right after I eat, ate that, I would struggle. Well, like I would feel it, but not just the organic piece, but Chipotle doesn't sprout their rice. They don't sprout mm -hmm. their beans, you know, and on top of that, it's not organic. So even though macro wise, I would be doing well, but the preparation of it, I still wasn't doing well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that you brought that up about the sprouting and fermenting and, and pressure cooking and all that stuff and the lectins. Um, it's just not something everyone thinks about because like you said, you thought, oh, I'm eating plants. That must be healthy, which is what a lot of people think. And it's funny that we're talking about this because uh, the very, the episode prior to this one with my friend, Dustin, he was talking about the exact same thing. He went vegan, vegetarian for a few years and thought, oh, I'm, I'm making myself healthy. But uh, we started talking about oxalates on that podcast, which is kind of almost in a sense, like the lectin connection with plants. There's oxalate connection with plants. And these are just different compounds that can actually cause problems. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, and also, so no medication now, what, what do you feel like was the biggest thing for you that really shifted you from getting off medication? The biggest thing for me, I would say sleep. Sleep. Uh, sleep was the biggest thing for me outside of, I would say going organic, uh, sleep would be the biggest thing for me because once I started optimizing my sleep quality and at the time I just had a cheap Samsung watch, you know, like an aura ring, nothing like that. But I read a book by Sean Stevenson, one of my favorite people in the world. Mm -hmm. It's sleep smarter. I probably, you probably read this book. I think millions of people have read this book and I implemented the things that I learned from that. And my sleep quality just became different. I woke up feeling completely different. I, the way I breathe was different. The way I handled myself was completely different. So optimizing my sleep quality, because I had a lot of times, and I'm sure you've experienced this. I think most people experience this, where I would struggle to, I to go to sleep at night. And then I would not want to wake up next day and my alarm would keep going off. And I just want to throw it out the window because I don't want to wake up like, you know, but when I optimize our sleep quality, I'll wake up before my alarm. And I'll fall asleep quite easily. And even throughout the day, I felt completely, completely better. So I would say sleep, sleep would be that one habit that really changed my life. Okay. I don't want to go too far down the sleep rabbit hole because I have so many questions for you, but give me like one or two major changes that you made that completely transform your sleep. I was just going to preface it by saying this. If you're trying to improve your sleep quality, any book you read or article you read, if they don't talk about resetting your circadian rhythm, mm -hmm. then that book or, or article is a waste of time because that's the whole thing you need to do to improve your sleep. Two yep. biggest habits I can say, 
is one, expose myself to light in the morning. So when I wake up, one of the first things that I do, of course, I meditate, um, you know, and, you know, do my breathing and stuff like that. Start off in a, in a parasympathetic state. I go outside for about 15 minutes before I start working, before I start making my wonderful podcast with my people out there, taking clients, whatever I'm doing, I go outside for about 15 minutes. So that's the first and most important habit, expose myself. So even if the sun is not bright, just seeing that sunlight resets my circadian rhythm. The next thing is, is the flip side to that is not exposing myself to, to false blue light at night. So that means that I have blue light bulbs in my, in my bathroom because that's the only light I turn on after the sun goes down because, you know, your boy got to take a shower. And then, you know, I'm not nasty, contrary to some, you know, different beliefs apparently. But uh, but yeah, seriously, I, I would have my blue lights at night. So it's block out. And it's, I think I bought them so long ago and they lasted well, but I think they might be about $8 for three of them. So they're not cheap. But this is worth your health. And it's only a few, like eight, well, eight, nine bucks or something like that. But I have those in my bathroom. So as I have on. And then after I take a shower or even after the sun goes down, I put on my blue light blocking glasses. And then all my phone filters out orange and the tablet I may possibly be on, which I try to limit that exposure and night filters out orange with the blue light. So those are the two, two things. Expose myself to real sunlight in the morning and block out artificial light in the evening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are those are great points. Those are probably my two biggest things that for me as well. Like my whole place, I have red bulbs. I have specific lamps in my bedroom and living room that have red bulbs in them. And I also have Himalayan salt lamps in each of my bathrooms so that once the sun goes down, I can put those on, have this really cool ambiance too in the whole house, and then also have my blue light blockers on. Yeah, great tips. So let's get a little bit more into the, the things that you're doing currently. Why did you decide to focus in weight management in your business? That is an excellent question, actually. And that's something that I get quite often because first, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a dietitian and I can't work with people who have underlying health issues. I'm a fitness coach, right? I'm a fitness nutrition. There's my certification is in. So naturally speaking, especially because I'm a like I'm a certified personal trainer. Most people I come to are going to come to me because I'm in the fitness industry. They want to lose weight. They want to build muscle. That's what they look for. However, even at the side of losing weight, most people just do not understand. They think, oh, it's about the calorie thing. Or some people might even know about macros and think, hey, it's just about my macros. But when I really start realizing that the reason why most people, and by the way, I think it's what, 70 to 75% of Americans are overweight, not obese, but overweight. I think obese is 40 it's, something. It's a lot. It's a lot. And, yeah. And I think 90 to 95% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy. Right. Yep. Sounds about right. So, so when I, when I saw that and I was like, okay, there's just so much that people do not learn. And really, and truly, if we improve our health, then the weight loss or muscle building or whatever you need to do, because sometimes people need to gain weight. You know, some people need to gain weight, people to lose weight. When I first started, I needed to gain weight. When you train your body to be as healthy as it should, everything else will take care of itself. That's what we call biohacking, right? We, we're changing our internal and external environment so our body is as healthy as it should be. Once your body does that, then everything else will take care of itself. Now, why to answer your question directly, why would I focus on weight management outside of the certification, outside of the certifications? I would say that that's kind of like the catchy thing because if most people are overweight and most people are also unhealthy, right? So if I can teach you the habits and I can tie it into not just being healthy, like if I come to you, if you're overweight, you say you're 50 pounds overweight and I come to you and say, hey, Rachel, of course, you know, you look amazing. You're not 50 pounds overweight, <laughs> but you know, if I come to you and say, hey, you know, I, I'm going to teach your body how to be healthy. Most people might be like, mm, I'm fine, whatever, move on. But if I come to you and say, you know what, I can help you to lose body fat, build muscle. Most people will be like, hmm, or it, it will spark their attention a little bit, right? So me being in the fitness industry is now I'm now set aside differently than even most fitness nutritionists or more fitness trainers, because I can give you tools that the traditional trainer or fitness nutritionist is not going to talk about. So it's catchy. And then that's a physical thing, because when you start to realize, hmm, I'm losing weight, 
hmm, I'm getting stronger. Hmm, all these things start to happen, then you immediately start getting those wins. It's some, it's easier to stick to that. That's why people like myself get addicted. I build more muscle. I'm about to be 40 this, this year, and I'm still building the muscle as if I'm in my 20s and 30s. Because, and that's something that keeps me addicted because it keeps going, it keeps going. It's something I can look forward to. But while that is happening, you're lowering inflammation. You're lowering mm-hmm. oxidative stress. Your sleep quality is in better. Your, 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 your mitochondria is functioning better. So many things are happening in that process, but you immediately, you initially came to me to lose weight, but what I'm training you and you will lose weight, but, but then while you're doing that, you're getting all these wonderful benefits at the same time, which I think is missing in the fitness industry. Mm -hmm. I like that you talked about lowering inflammation because I don't even, that's, I do not focus on weight management in my practice at all. Like if someone comes to me and they're like, I just want to lose weight. Like, uh, you know, I might not be the best person. I'm not going to give you a crazy quick fix thing. I'm not going to tell you to go juice fast or like fast for seven days or anything like that. Um, but what I do see is that all of my clients or a lot of them will just be like, Hey, this is crazy. I, I just had this lady tell me, um, a couple of days ago, she goes, I lost, I think she said she lost like 20 pounds within the first two months, which is, which is a little, that's a little drastic, but she wasn't trying to lose weight. We were working on acid reflux and a whole bunch of other stuff. And just by addressing her gut issues and lowering inflammation with the food she was eating made her lose weight, which was a good outcome for her. She enjoyed it. But like, but most people don't realize that our bodies are holding on to that fat because we're inflamed from environmental toxins, because we're not sleeping properly, because we're putting inflammatory foods in our bodies. So like you're hundred percent, right. You could tell them, yeah, we're going to help you lose weight, but it's all of the lifestyle things that are so important. It's not just about calories in and calories out or counting macros or any of that kind of stuff. So, um, and I, and I do want to speak on this too, or want you to speak on it. Like, what do you have to say about those people who are like, Oh, the, just do this juice cleanse. They're like, this is a 30 day quick fix program. Like what's wrong with those. And what's a true reasonable timeline for somebody to lose weight that you would say. If you read that on Instagram, TikTok, or wherever, just, just get rid of your phone or something. And if somebody <laughs> comes to you and tell you that just turn around, run away. and don't even look back at them because it, there's, you've been in this industry for so many years now, and I've been in the industry and we know one thing, it is all has to be individualized. Mm-hmm. All has to be, for example, okay, so I'm metabolically flexible. I can cut my calories and lose weight with no problem whatsoever because I'm metabolically flexible. And we, I know we're going to get into that later on, mm-hmm. but somebody who's not metabolically flexible can cut their calories all they want and might even gain weight. Right. So it, it's, it's not, if, if you just focus on this one thing, yeah, it, it, it can be helpful for some people. But it has to be individualized to you. Now, this is something I mean, a flip side to that. And I think it's, I think it's like a triangle, right? Like you have the big habits at the, at the bottom. Then you go, as you go up, then you have other, you have other little things that you may need to change and you go to the top. And then the top is like the, the small, minute things, right? Now, somebody like myself, again, who is metabolically flexible, a juice cleanse might help me. A, a, day, a fast day or two might help me because I'm already there. I just need to, I just need that last piece, that last finish. But for someone who's 50 pounds or hundred pounds overweight, I wouldn't recommend that. Another example, let's say you do you don't do a juice cleanse. Well, well, and I have a, a buddy that I talk to about this all the time and he keeps complaining. He's like, I'm not losing weight. I'm not losing weight, but he doesn't listen to me. So, you know, he's not a client of mine and for reasons, <laughs> but I don't think on uh, friends as clients, put it that way. It's not a good idea <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> and he juices, he juices. And he tells me all the time how much he loves juices. He doesn't eat enough protein, but he loves to juice, but he's not severely overweight, but he is overweight. He can you look and tell that he needs to build more muscle and lose some fat. So he's over fat, but not necessarily overweight for his BMI. Mm-hmm. Right? And I've told him, I said, look, the issue is that, look, I don't have a problem with you juicing, but you don't get enough protein in your diet because the other side with him juicing is he is sugar addicted. And when you're flooding your body with juices all the time, even though they're natural sugars, it's still sugar. 
And remember, we're juicing. What what's not there after you after you juice the the the, the fruit? The fiber. Fiber that that, bound, exactly. that binds in the sugar that slows down the absorption into the bloodstream. Exactly. And and so one day he showed me. He's like, look at this picture of this whatever juice I made. And again, I don't have a problem with juicing. I think if it's done correctly. But mm-hmm. he's like, look at this and look at all the minerals that's in this juice. I said, okay, that's nice. But do you know that too much of any good thing can become a bad thing? You just mentioned oxalates, right? Yes. I had someone one time who was a client of mine who told me that he had a dietitian that put him on this plan and they told him to eat greens with every meal. And then he decided to eat spinach. That was going to be his green. And he ate spinach all the live long day. Oh. And he started, and he's, you know where I'm going with this. He started losing weight. What did he develop? Kidney stones. Why? Because oh. of oxalates. Now, is spinach bad? No. No. But you're not supposed to be eating spinach like you're eating popcorn, basically. Like you were just popping, like going through spinach like Skittles, like all the time. And too much of a good thing can become can also become a bad thing. So at the end of the day, it has to be personalized based on your needs, where you are, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Why Why do you think most weight loss approaches fail? The reason why most weight loss approaches fail because they focus on calories or macros and they do not focus on being metabolically flexible. Okay. Now, my question to you is, do you want me to go through metabolic flexibility now? Yeah, let's talk about that. What is metabolic flexibility? Let's start there. Okay. So, and this is where a lot of people are missing and it's still a little bit newer to science, but it's absolutely groundbreaking, absolutely fantastic. Our bodies use enzymes to break down fat, carbs, and proteins. The main enzymes, we're looking at proteases for protein, amylase for carbs and some sugars, and also uh, lipase for fat. Those are the most well-known, even though there are other enzymes that our body mm-hmm. uses. Now, for the traditional healthy person, so I'm not talking about someone who may have type 2 diabetes or hypothyroid and something like that, but someone who, let's say, is free of underlying health conditions, right? And it can be true for some others as well. If y- our bodies are just and create the right enzymes based on a couple of factors. One, your background, right? If you're coming from a background where, let's say you are, you come from a cold environment, right? Where the people, your family is used to eating meat and maybe meat and vegetables and meat potatoes, you might have more proteases and lipase. But if you're like myself, who's I'm from the Caribbean and I'm used to eating fruits, and when I growing up, I hated vegetables. And even now I still have to kind of, I eat vegetables with every meal, but I have to make myself eat it. Like I'll be eating more than fruits than anything else. Well, now more for fat, I eat more fat and protein, but, but yeah, anyway, if you're, if you're, if you're from that kind of environment, then you may be born with more amylase, which is may make you a better sugar or carb burner. Right now in caveat to that, it should, most human beings, no matter where you're from, we are born with more amylase than any other mammal on the planet. And that would be true for most human beings, right? So people would think that we're naturally car burners, right? Mm -hmm. However, this is what tends to happen. The other side to that is our lifestyle choices, right? Because then our bodies will shift and it doesn't take a very long time. So if you've been eating a high sugar diet or high carb diet all your life, your body shoot for most people will create more carb burning enzymes because that's what you're feeding it and if you're low protein or low fat then it's going to down downplay proteases proteases and amylase and, and lipase sorry so layman term meaning that you become better at burning carbs but less efficient at burning protein breaking down protein and fat so hence here comes the periodic table eat a bunch of fiber right But then we become less efficient at fat and protein. Flip side to that, right? If you eat a lot of protein and fat, same thing, flip side that happens. You become better at breaking those down and less efficient at carbs. Let me give you a flip side example. Somebody who goes on ketosis and stays on ketosis for a very long time. What happens? They lose a lot of weight because at first they have the keto flu. Like when I switch into ketosis, I do not have the keto flu. I switch into ketosis, I move on, I'm good because I'm metabolically flexible. Someone switches into ketosis who's never done it before. They don't have enough. If they've never been used to high protein, high fat, they don't have sufficient enzymes to break those down. So you're in the keto flu 
because your body is struggling. It's not used to that. And that's a hard time. That's why you can feel like you're going to die in those few days because your body is not accustomed to that. It doesn't have it over time. And that's why like experts like Ben Azadi, who's from the keto camp, he slowly has the clients increase their fat and protein. And then after a little while, he pushes them into ketosis. He doesn't have them jump into ketosis. And that depends on the client, but he does that quite often because most people don't have that ability, Mm -hmm. right? Now, long story short or long story long is that over time, when, when when you feed your body what you're supposed to feed your body, when you have the right balance, when you eat protein and fat, you'll be able to break down protein and fat efficiently. When you eat carbs, you will be able to eat carbs efficiently. So then we're talking about a balance, having the right balance in your gut, the right enzymes to be able to perform both tasks. Mm -hmm. How long does it take for somebody to rebuild a different enzyme profile? It depends on a few factors. And also if you're working with an expert, AKA Neurologo Zika Powell, but (laughs) <laughs> well, seriously speaking, it depends on really a couple big factors are if you're a fat burner or you're a sugar burner from the start. That's important because what I've tend to find is that is that what moving from sugar burner to fat burner is harder than fat burner to sugar burner because human beings are naturally born are born with more amylase. So we're that any other mammal on the planet. So we naturally have more ability to break down carbs for most human beings, right? Mm -hmm. That's why if you, let's say you went keto and you switch over to carbs, you don't have a carb flu, right? Your body will, your body can, you may, you may feel a little weird, a little bit different, but you can switch over to burning carbs maybe in a few weeks, but switching from being a carb burner to a fat burner, you go through the keto flu, right? Because, because our bodies are not, don't usually eat that much fat or protein and you're not accustomed to eating it so i would say this if and i it was it thomas delawa or robert wolf he has a really cool youtube video on this topic robert wolf i don't know if you're familiar with him has a really cool video on the topic and he basically says that if you were to go really low carb and high fat for a little while the average human being will take about six to eight weeks to become really good at fat burning while still maintaining some amylase at that point, once you become good at fat burning, you may have to reintroduce some carbs into your diet. So you don't downregulate amylase. Right. Mm-hmm. But someone moving from, and this part he didn't mention, but it's from my own research from fat burning into carb burning might only take a week or two to switch mm-hmm. over into that. Because we, as humans, we're just naturally built to be able to do that. That's why carbs is the body's preferred source of fuel. Right. Why mm-hmm. is that? Because it enzymes that our body uses to create that fuel. Mm-hmm. Well, we also have certain parts of our certain organs that only use glucose usually too. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, do you, do you support people with enzymes, like just taking digestive en- enzymes with their meals as they're kind of moving into these phases? I believe so. I, it, it does depend on the person, but I believe that take, if you asked me this question a year or two ago, I would have said no. In fact, somebody did ask me this question and I said no. Mm. But over time, working with uh, clients from Lumen, I started to realize that the enzymes do play a part because if you're struggling to break down fat in the beginning, if you take some digestive enzymes, that will make it less taxing on your body and it allows you to be able to kind of break down that fat. And eventually you won't need the enzymes at all, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But in the beginning of your month, even maybe a month, maybe even two months of your journey, taking enzymes can be helpful to give you that boost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's actually what I do with all my clients, just because a lot of them have underlying gut issues. And so if the gut lining is leaky or permeable and they're having some issues possibly producing certain enzymes or absorbing their nutrients, then I just have them do enzymes alongside everything. Like, wow, we heal all of that. And that way we can really optimize everything they're doing. Um, so does, do certain workouts play a role in achieving metabolic flexibility? Oh, 100%. I actually have an article on my website, zkhill.com on exercise intensity and, um, weight loss or weight management or something like that. 
But and I broke down a bunch of stuff there. We'll talk about your, you know, your heart rate and how you should train and so on and so forth. But I'm going to give everybody the Reader's Digest version, right? Okay. So basically, and Ben Greenfield popular, I've made this really, really popular, even though it was, it's been around before him. But when you train in zone one, zone two, which is a lower heart rate, that promotes fat oxidation. Fat oxidation basically means breaking down fat from food which you eat, but mostly from your own body to create energy. Now, that's not the same as ketosis. People get that wrong all the time. You can break down body fat and not necessarily be in ketosis. That's a whole different story. But you, it promotes fat oxidation. So if you're trying to lose body fat and you're training in a higher zone than you're supposed to, you're not really promoting fat oxidation, breaking down your own body fat, right? Zone one, zone two, or lower zones. I have the whole breakdown of different ways to calculate your heart rate on my article if you want to check it out. But and, but think about it from an ancestral standpoint. Okay, okay, do it, do it this. I grew up in Jamaica, right? I had a hard time keeping body fat on me. I walked all the time. I moved all the time. Just by naturally, I used to, my grandparents used to give me money to go to school. I was like for a taxi and I would save the money and walk to school because it was only like two miles away. And then after I save it up and back then they had CDs and I'll be like, I remember Big Willis style was like the first CD I bought with my <laughs> own money. <laughs> right. Nice. And, and um, I'm, you know, I'm an old fart, but you know, <laughs> but you know, it's so walking, staying in that low zone promotes fat oxidation, right? Now let's say, and I see this and I've gone to gyms before where I see they, people have these programs, right? And they're like, go, 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 move, 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 work, work, work. And you know, whatever they want to call it. And they're trying to promote fat loss. And I'll say to people, I'll say to the trainer, like, why are you doing this? You know, well, this is my program. This is what we do. I say, yeah, but is there anything you know about that person that tells you that this program is good for that person? Because six months later, they're still in the same program. They haven't lost a pound, but they feel like they're doing something healthy because they're working out. Well, you're not training, you're, you're, you're stressing your body consistently. What did we say humans are born with than more than any other animals, um, mammals on the planet? Amylase. We are naturally carb burners. So when you stress your body like that, what do your body ask for? Carbs. Your body doesn't necessarily get to its own fat. So if you are a not a good fat burner, you don't want to be training in these high intensity zones all the time. On top of that, you could be depleting your muscle glycogen. And we know that building lean muscle is also important because building lean muscle has a direct impact on your metabolism, mm -hmm. right? So if you're depleting that muscle glycogen, you may eventually start to even burn muscle mass. That's why people lose a lot of weight really quick. You lose muscle mass, you lose, lose glycogen, and you also burn your muscle and you're training in a zone that's too high than you're supposed to. So then you start burning muscle mass. So, that's, so your BMI starts to drop. I'm sorry, your BMR, your base on metabolic rate starts to drop because you're losing that muscle mass. And, and then you're never getting to that body fat. Now, the flip side to that, actually, before I continue, let me say this. Then people say to me, you hate cardio. I say, no, I don't hate cardio. Cardio is important. And cardiovascular is good for you. It's healthy. But for most people, it's not, we're not biologically designed to, be, to do, like, do that all the time. My cardio is post. So during the week, I have my short workouts, right? Like today, I did just chest. At the end of it, I did about eight to 10 minutes. And I went, I basically went, went all out on my, on my, on my run mm -hmm. and that's my cardio. And I train my, and that's, I do it two times a week. And that's it for me, unless I'm training for a run, a marathon or something like that. That's it for me. That's all my body needs. Because most of the time I want to stay in that zone one, zone two training, like weightlifting, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where that side comes in. The flip side to that though, is if you are really good at fat burning, but you're not good at car burning, you can increase those intensity of your workouts to create that need in your body to where you can burn more carbs. But the thing is that not, that's not most people. Most people who are trying to lose weight are insulin resistant and already eat more carbs than they're supposed to. So that's not most people. But if you are one of those people who, let's say you've been, you did keto for an extremely long time and you're not good at burning carbs, you can have some more cardio or um, high intensity work in your routine to create to, to create that. But again, if that's not going to be the case for most people. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Do you like some HIIT workouts for people? Yeah, I like, I think H, um, because I'm more of an HIRT person than a HIIT, necessarily a HIIT person. 
which uh, which basically because with a high intensity, your heart rate really doesn't drop much. A high intensity repeat training is basically where you your heart rate picks up, it drops, then it picks up again. So an example would be, let's say you're jogging and you're just jogging at a nice at a pace and you get to a, to a pole, then you just sprint to the next pole, then you stop. Then you don't stop. You'd slow down when you get that pole, then you jog and then you sprint off again. Kind of like insanity, like Shanti used to do, like something like that, mm-hmm. but not as not as crazy because Shanti is the old animal, whole animal within itself. Yeah. But something like that. Or if you were to do, let's say, high intensity or even hit um high intensity repeat training or just high intensity, however you want to do it, you want to incorporate weights in it. That's one way you can get your weight training in as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Even though I do recommend slow and steady to be the base of your weight training, but you can have a day or two of that where you're more calisthenics, you do more push ups or you do more body weight squats or, you know, and your heart rate stays, a heart rate stays where it's supposed to be. But all that has to be individualized. If it's not individualized, you can be doing the same. I've seen it. I've gone to gyms where I've seen the same people doing these, doing these programs for months. And don't lose a pound. And what else we don't realize is training in that sense, because you're basically telling your body that you need more carbs, raises adrenaline, Mm -hmm. raises cortisol, leaves us in a sympathetic state for most of the times, can disrupt your sleep quality and create more cravings. So then on top of that, you're fighting off more cravings because your cortisol and adrenaline are higher than they're supposed to be and you and, and may also impact your sleep quality so what are you really accomplishing by doing excess cardio mhm yep i totally agree i i see that as a huge thing with um with a lot of the women i work with they're like oh i'm you know i'm working out all the time i do these more higher intensity, prolonged hour long videotapes, or, you know, I'm running, I'm doing all these things. I can't lose any weight. And then, I mean, we don't even, I don't even need to look at their hormones to tell this, but I do look at adrenal gland function and I see their adrenal glands and they're depleted. Their, their cortisol is tanked or it's too high. And in both of those cases, it's like, you've been stressing your body too much. And that is making you hold on to weight, just like you said, and, or you're spiking your blood sugar all the time. And bleeding to insulin or is this, it's, it's all tied together. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, okay. So let's talk. So we talked about fat loss. Let's talk a little bit about building muscle. Do you have recommendations on specific things, things can, people can do maybe supplement wise or anything else for building muscle? Yeah. Now everything I said again is going to be individualized. I have to back up before I answer that question and say, when it comes to building muscle, the first step is always going to be becoming metabolically flexible. If you are a sugar burner, you need to be better burning carbs. If you're a car, I'm sorry, burning fat. If you're a fat burner, better carbs, you need to be metabolically flexible. Reason being is this muscle and fat kind of work against each other, right? So you kind of like up and down, right? So if you build, sometimes if you eat, if you eat way too much, you can build a lot of muscle and a lot of fat at the same time. But when you start to lose weight, you're going, you may be burn both of them at the same time too, right? So t- I'm talking about what I do, which is I build lean muscle while burning body fat, right? But I can only do that if I'm metabolically flexible. That way the food that I'm eating doesn't convert to fat. My body doesn't store it. My body actually uses it, right? Mm-hmm. So step one is always becoming metabolically flexible. And with, I mean, whenever you're ready, we'll talk about lumen and how that plays a part into it. The next step, and then after you are metabolically flexible and you're able to actually use the food that you're that you that you're eating, the next step is start to look at protein, right? As far as nutrition concerned, because a lot of people, especially females, don't like to eat a lot of protein. If you tell a male to eat a steak, a lot of males are going to be like, "All right, I can do this all day long," right? But most women they don't love eating a lot of protein. But there's a doctor, I can't remember his name right now, but he said something profound to me. Well, not to me, on a podcast. I don't know him personally. But he said that whatever weight you're trying to be, that's how much protein you need to eat. Now, that may differ based on the person a little bit, but it's around the math. So like my goal right now, I'm, I'm about 162. When I wake up in the morning, I'm about 162, 163 with about 12% body fat. My goal is to be 170 at around 12% body fat. How much protein do I eat a day? At least 170 grams a day. Actually, maybe a little bit more, right? 
so because that's the goal I'm aiming for. So if you take care of the weight loss factor, if you are 150 pounds and your goal is to get to 120, then you need to eat at least 120 grams of protein, at least. Now that does a lot of things. One keeps you satiated, number one, right? That's the most important thing. And now I need to add, by the way, never, I don't recommend eating more than 40 to 40 to 50 grams of protein per meal for males. 40 is probably better. Women, 30 to 40, only because it's taxing on your body to be able to digest that much at one time. And you're going to feel it if you do. You will feel it, you will feel it when you eat it. So you kind of want to spread your protein throughout the day. But eating adequate protein is number one. Now we know about we know about amino acids and all the benefits of amino acids for so many health benefits, but we're talking about building muscle. So yes, is getting adequate amino acid is important for building lean muscle and creatine. People don't talk enough about creatine. Mm. That's something you also get from mostly red meat and fish, right? Especially like nice fatty fish, like salmon, tuna, and stuff like that, right? I think you get some from chicken, some from turkey, but chick fish and red meat will be your biggest sources of creatine. Now, something that you can do, and I had someone the other day, I put them on this protocol. If you don't eat enough protein or you already eat enough protein, but let's say you're an athlete and you want to boost that, right? Because that's what I personally do. Then the, you can, I always recommend essential amino acids because essential aminos, of course, you know, are the nine that our bodies can't make. We have to ingest via food. Now, the research shows that when you take essential amino acids around the time that you train, then that can boost performance, boost strength, and also help you to, re to, to, to recover well and be in building muscle mass. So my favorite essential aminos are from AminoCo. I absolutely love it because they're the first company I've found that have a patented. Actually, initially, their essential aminos were made for NASA astronauts to help them perform better for perform better during training and heal they used to help them to maintain muscle mass while they're in space, but they reformulated it for the regular human beings like myself. And it's, they use a nice formula of nine essential aminos for a really good blend. And they also combine creatine and they have the formula of the perform, which is what I start drinking before I'm training and drink it while I'm training, which has the essential aminos, the creatine, and I use green leaf, I go all natural. That's my favorite flavor from them is the all natural. So I use, it's uh it's a green leaf extract, which may sound gross, but to me it's absolutely delicious. They use stevia for the sweetener. And and that, I drink that while I'm training. Post-training, which is usually a couple of hours after, usually I'm drinking it during an interview, but I already drank it before this because I was hungry. I just, <laughs> I, I, it has essential aminos, creatine, and also whey protein isolate. Now, ev almost every bodybuilder in the world takes whey protein. But what's the problem with whey protein? Most whey protein is bad quality. And most people that I know who take whey protein have a hard time digesting whey protein. But if you take, I'm sorry, they're whey protein concentrate, not isolate. But if you drink whey protein isolate or like isopure, for example, or whey protein concentrate, then you can deliver to your body protein without having to break down all those different aspects of, let's say, taking whey protein as well. And then also most whey protein unless it's isopure or I like isolate is going to carry carbs along with it. And then you do that. And if you're trying to lose weight, that may not be the best thing to do if you already stored enough carbs. So, so the perform is what I drink bef um, before and do my workouts to, to improve my performance and do the heels, what I drink post-workout. And I make that a part of my routine. Now that's may not be on a caveat for that may not be for everyone. I was talking to someone earlier and he's a carnivore. And he eats more meat than I do. I eat a lot of meat, but he more eats more meat than I do. But he doesn't eat vegetables. I'm an omnivore. So sometimes I back off and I'll eat some fruits and some vegetables. But he basically eats meat like four, five, maybe even six times a day. To him, there's no point in taking perform or heal or taking creatine because you already have, your body has what it needs. Mm -hmm. But the traditional person in my opinion, should be an omnivore. And that's when the supplementation can help you get to that next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with the, uh, the whole protein thing. My, my thing that I help people start on is at least one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass, which is a pretty, pretty standard recommendation. Um, but a hundred percent, I see so many women 
they look at that and they're like, oh my gosh, I am way, way far off from that. So we have to start slow, but I try and get them. Okay. Like let's try to get to like 30 grams per meal, at least to get that protein up. But, and also I love what you said about the amino acids, cause that can be a great supplement. And I actually, I don't know if you know who Dr. David Minkoff is, but he has, um, a supplement, the perfect aminos. And he was on the podcast a few episodes ago and we went super deep all into amino acids and like how you can use them to help start to reverse chronic illnesses and all sorts of stuff with proper dosing of them, of course, like much higher doses, but definitely some really good tools out there that you can use and start to incorporate into your life. Um, it sounds like you want to talk a little bit about lumen. Do you want to touch on that really quickly before we end? Yeah, definitely. Before I do that, I want to talk about the aminos too. Um, so on my show, I'm going to have one of the scientists from Amino Co on my on my show. I think it should be in a month or two from now. So to kind of subscribe and stay through for that. We're going to dive into all that because they have they they do have aminos outside of for performance and training, which is for other aspects of health. And we're going to dive deep into those. So. So awesome. I think you do we definitely want to hear that. I'm going to listen to your interview as well, because that sounds really interesting. It's right up my alley. And I also got to say that on my um, on the aminoco.com slash Zico Health, uh, my code Zico Health actually gives you, or if you just go to the website, aminoco.com slash Zico Health, you would get 30% off their products. So it's something to try and add it to. I just do got to stress that I say try the or the all natural try the all natural. I stressed that. And I told them, I said, look, now some people don't like the taste of all natural, but I definitely recommend going all natural. It's going to, your health is going to thank you in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, now, with that being said, let's talk about Lumen. So I stumbled across Lumen because I saw an ad one day and it was saying, you know, learn, you know, breathe into this product and it will help you to understand if you're burning sugar or if you're burning fat and so on and so forth. Right. Now, me being in the field, I understand how the science works. CO2, you know, Krebs cycle produce, produce CO2. If you burn fat, it produces a lower level than if you burn carbs and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to bore everybody with all that biology stuff. But I thought it was cool. I was like, this is crazy because I have to guess with my clients. Like, I, I, yeah. I'm pretty sure I, 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 I don't think I've ever been wrong. But I would say that I still have to guess. Versus lumen, you just blow into it and it's like, okay, you are a car burner. Now, caveat to this, when you're at rest, you should be burning fat mostly, mostly, not completely, but mostly. When you are exercising or you're in, in, in uh, bodies on any kind of stress, you should be burning carbs mostly, right? That's why, again, I talk about high intensity. You're going to be, you should be burning more carbs, right? But most of our day, we're not running around and doing backflips and throwing and throwing on weights up in the air. No, we're at the computer or you know, having a podcast with my wonderful friend, Rachel over here, right? I'm not sure be burning carbs. Mm -hmm. So, so the issue is that, and this is what the research shows is that people who are, let's say myself, when they test our metabolism, when we wake up in the morning, we burn fat the night before. But when, but people who are overweight, when they test their metabolism, when they wake up, they weren't burning fat the night before they were burning carbs. And that's one piece of spectrum, but that's a huge piece of spectrum because let's say the average person sleeps seven to eight hours, right? If you're burning fat while you're sleeping, that's seven to eight hours of fat oxidation alone, not counting the other 16, right? Just that alone, seven to eight hours of fat. Think about how much fat you can lose over time just by burning fat while you sleep, mm -hmm. right? And, then, and the other times you need to be burning fat, like I mentioned, if you're in low stress environment and so on and so forth, right? But if you're not and you're burning carbs throughout your sleeping, your body never gets to that body fat. And your body does get to that body fat, you, you could be more likely, if you're burning carbs like that, you're probably insulin resistant or on your way to become insulin resistant. You probably have more stored glycogen that you're actually supposed to have and your blood sugar is probably higher than it's supposed to be, right? So Lumen, when you wake up in the morning, you take Lumen, you blow into it. And then it tells you if you burn fat or carbs the night before. That helps you to understand if you're a natural fat burner or you're a natural carb burner. Now, there are other times you can test throughout the day. Like it has tests for you blow into it. It takes like a couple minutes and you blow into it and it tells you at post-workout, what did you burn? And that's another way to test high intensity versus like weight training because you would realize that most people after high intensity, 
an hour after it's gonna they're gonna burn carbs but for some people a few hours after when they go back they switch back into parasympathetic maybe they may they may get back into fat burning if they're metabolically flexible like myself i will switch back into fat burning a few hours after like a high intensity session right versus okay. some people may never switch back into fat burning because they don't have the correct around the enzyme gut enzymes to break down fat like it's supposed to so anyway so you blow into lumen it tells you in the morning if you burn fat or carbs the night before then they have an algorithm that's created by their diet by their dietitians and nutritionists and it gives you a recommendation for that day and say okay this is how much fat you should eat this is how much carbs you should eat this is how much protein you should eat and you log it against it if it's connected to your workout so um so you know whatever you use for to track your workout i recommend you do apple apple or whatever it is it then adjusts based on your workout so of what you should eat right and it gives you that so some people let's say you do do high intensity that day but they gave you low carb they may increase how much carb you should eat because you 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 depleted whatever glycogen stores you would you would have had going into that workout right and we and the whole point is not one of the points is not to get your body into stress now over mm -hmm. time it fluctuates and this is one of the cool things about lumen Let's say after you a while, and I'm talking about just from a car burner to a fat burner, you can go the other way too. But most people are going to relate this way. So after a while, you become good at fat burning. Lumen starts to throw in what they call, they have low carb days, medium days, high carb days. On top of that, they have what's called boost days, which you're basically switching your metabolism completely into carb burning. So for some people like myself, they'll recommend like 300 grams of carbs. And some people may think, whoa, that's crazy. But I have, but my my glycogen stores are so flat that most of that, my body, my muscles are going to be stored in my muscles anyway, right? And the rest of that, I'm really going to burn off. So I will eat 300 grams of carbs and I won't gain a single pound at all. In fact, I may even gain some muscle in that process because like Ben Greenfield called those uh, refeed days. And that's before I lose that's why I call them refeed days. And I just have my refeed days where I'll eat more carbs to store up my muscle glycogen. And then, so it gives you that freedom. So then you're not just thinking about calories as a part of it. Yes, they look at that, but they also look at your macro breakdown and they also look at what is your metabolism doing at that particular point and then give you the recommendations based on that. And what's cool, another cool thing is that once you become a Lumen customer, I'll say part of Lumen community, you get access to the Facebook group that right now I think has like 37 or 38,000 people. Well, they asked me to be one of their group experts so I, whenever people have questions about, hey, workouts or how much water should I drink or how do I improve my sleep quality, all that stuff. Well, I'm one of the five experts that goes in and help people and answer those questions for them. So you get access to me and other, like Maria. Maria is the expert in women's fitness. And Maria, Maria will talk about menopause and birth and all those other things that plays a factor into it. That's not my area of expertise. So I let Maria drive that, right? But then I drive the gut enzyme questions and I drive that workout questions and so on, so on, so forth. So you get access to that community of, and there are other people who will answer questions who may not quote unquote be an expert, but we're like, hey, this is what happens to me and this is how it works for me. And mm -hmm. of course, Lumen goes in and answer questions. Well, so you get access to the entire community. Um, last thing I'm going to say is, of course, I'm going to have a discount. So if you go to lumen.me, the code Zico Health, I make it easy for everyone, Zico Health gives you because i'm a brand in um expert for them my code gives you because most code gives you 10 percent off or something like that my code gives you 50 dollars off their uh their service every time you use it so it's so lumen.me use code zico health awesome thank you for sharing all that well final question for you if you were to give one piece of advice or one tip that people can implement into their life either starting today or maybe this week that can help them live a healthier, happier life. What would that be? You put me on the stage, Rachel. That's so unfair. You gotta make me think about this one. I don't okay. like to think. <laughs> no. Improve your sleep quality. It all mm -hmm. starts with sleep. If you don't improve your sleep quality, and of course, I never, I always deliver. I have an article on getting quality sleep that I perfected over the years on ZikaHealth.com. Check it out. It's my most successful articles. Help thousands of people reach, and um, a lot of people reach out to me about it, but. Improving your sleep quality is number one, you know? Mm -hmm. So learn how to reset your circadian rhythm, learn how sunlight impacts your circadian rhythm, the timing of the food that you eat. Some people may need some glucose at night to help them sleep. Some people may not, 
you know, like when I'm in ketosis, I don't need it. But if I'm not in ketosis, my brain may may require the glucose because it can't run on fatty acids. It needs ketones or glucose. So, you know, learn all these habits. Learn if you travel, things that you might be able to do to help you to fall asleep. Do you need to take melatonin or maybe you don't need to make a tweak here or there? You know, learn and implement the temperature in your house, but the, the daytime versus the nighttime. Like these are so many things I'm breaking down. So anyway, I don't get paid for this article. I write it from the goodness of my heart because you know I am such a nice guy. But go to ZikaHealth.com and check out the article. Um, it's on my on my main menu on how to get quality sleep and implement that in your life. Awesome. And then we'll have links in the show notes to your Instagram, your website, your podcast, all that kind of stuff. So people want to reach out to you, then they can go in the show notes and find all that information. But thank you so much for being on the show today. That was great. Thanks, Rachel. I got to have you back for a number two. And I would love to be on the show again, definitely. That sounds like a good plan. Thanks for watching the episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you like the video and leave a comment and share it with a friend who really needs to hear it. Because when you share this information, you're also going to help other people level up their health. And if you or somebody else you know wants to work on their health and they're looking for a functional medicine practitioner, feel free to reach out to me to apply to work together. Thanks for watching and keep striving to become your healthiest, happiest self.